Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning to our online students as well. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for this course. So uh, this semester, uh, years I'll be teaching two subjects. Um, so the first one is lifestyle evangelism, which we're going to do now. And the second one is identity. That is our identity in Christ. Right, let me just add those who are joining here. All right, so those who are online, the notes are available on the uh, classroom, uh, Google Classrooms on the stream. So uh, feel free to download those notes. And even as we go through the entire course, you can you know, uh, just reference that and join along with us. Um, so even before we begin this course, I just want to put out a few things. One is uh, if you have any questions in between the course, right? Now feel free to ask your questions. You can just raise your hands, ask questions. Those who are online, if you have any questions, uh, you can also just feel free to post your questions and we'll answer them uh, during uh, the session. So lifestyle evangelism uh, is the course that we're going to start off with today. And this course is one hour a week, right? So we will try to cover a lot of material here. And identity will be two hours a week. OK? All right. So every, everyone have your books with you, right? OK. So we're going to learn about lifestyle evangelism. The, let me give you an overview of this course. Right? Now, when the Lord Jesus, he resurrected. And what is the last thing he told his disciples? He said to his disciples, go and make disciples right he didn't say go and start the church right he didn't say go and start the fivefold ministry or he didn't say go become a prophet apostle he didn't say all of that he said go make disciples now in this course we will learn about how you and i are called to evangelize right now many of us are from different uh, settings, right? Some of us are from cities, some of us are from towns, some of them are from, uh, you know, from villages. So we have different kinds of evangelism, evangelistic strategies, right? So what works in the city may not work in the town. What works in the town may not work in the city, right? And so today, this, this entire session, we're going to talk about how wherever we are, right? Whether we are in the workplace, whether we are students, whether we are in, in, in business, whether we are in ministry, wherever we are, we are called to live a lifestyle of evangelism. Right? What is the meaning of lifestyle? Online students, you can feel free to share your thoughts as well. What's the meaning of lifestyle? Lifestyle is something that we do every day. Right? So for example, today, you know, we got up, we had our prayer time, we read the word, hopefully. Uh, then we got ready. We know, OK, 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock is breakfast. Then there's prayer time. And so it's a lifestyle. Now, evangelism or reaching out to people must also become a lifestyle. So in this course, we will learn about how sharing the gospel is a natural thing for you and I as believers. Right? Uh, now, even, even as we go ahead, we will also look at what are the hindrances that stop us from sharing the gospel and uh, why sometimes we, 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 you know, we are fearful in sharing the gospel. What is the power of the gospel? How we can share the gospel? So we learn all of that, right? Right. So Daniel says, lifestyle is the way one person lives. Yes. Right. So let's go to chapter one. Chapter one, we're talking about sharing Jesus, the necessity and the urgency, right? Why is it necessary to share about Jesus? Why should we share about Jesus? See, I've become a believer now. I'm happy I'm a believer, right? I'm going to heaven, so enough. 
right? Why should I share about Jesus? Right? If they believe, let them believe. If they don't believe, that's okay. I am a believer. I'll go to heaven. But Jesus' mindset was not that way. He said, go and make disciples. Right? So let's read this portion. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Uh, the mic is there. You can feel free to read. Matthew chapter 8, 28, verse 18 to 20. 28. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Okay. 18 to 20. 18 to 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of Son and of Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. This is the last thing that Jesus is telling his disciples. Go therefore and make disciples. So you and I are called to witness to people. Right? It is not that you know I have to be wait to become a pastor, I have to wait to become an evangelist, I have to wait to become an apostle, or I should become a or I am a worship leader. I'm not called to share the gospel. No. Jesus is saying we are all called to witness to one another. We're all different. We, each one of us have different gifts. We have different callings. We have different areas of service that we are in, right? Now, for example, some of us may be evangelists, right? For them to share the gospel, it's very easy. Have you, have you met evangelists, right? If you've, if you've met evangelists, wherever they are, they'll share the gospel. Whether they are in the train, whether they're in the shop, it is very natural for them. Now, the worship leaders have a different gift. They're good in music. They're good in singing. Then you've got people who are good in teaching. Then you've got pastors. Or then you've got people who are in business, who are working. Now, Jesus is saying, we are all called to witness. All of us. So we don't have the excuse of saying, hey, I am only a worship leader. Or I am only going to sing songs. I'll write songs. and you know. All of us are called to witness the gospel. Whether we are in the city, in the town, wherever we are, we are called to witness the gospel. Right? We all, in, in this chapter, let's look at the necessity of sharing the gospel. Why is it necessary to share the gospel? Now, the gospel is there. Somebody share the gospel with each one of us. We've become a believer. We've understood. But why is it necessary? Let's look at a few points here. First point, every person needs a savior. The Bible teaches us that every one of us, all of us, are sinners. Right? Uh, all of us are sinners. So all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Our sins have separated us from Christ. Right? Because of sin, we are separated from Christ. And we are brought into bondage in between Satan and hell. Right? So what's happened? When we look at the Old Testament, when God made Adam and Eve, he made them perfect. Adam sinned. What happened? We fell into bondage. So the enemy brought bondage into our life. He brought death. The things of evil started. Cain killed Abel. Murder started. All kinds of evil started. Why? Because Satan has been given authority. Right? We cannot save ourselves by our own ability. Right? Now, remember this. No matter where we are, we may be you know, there may be people who are very rich. There may be people who are very influential, full of wisdom. Great people, great political leaders. Whoever they are, 
they will not be able to save themselves. Yes or no? Right? They cannot save themselves. Nobody can say, you know, hey, I'm the richest man in the world, so I'll pay you. Whatever I have, I'll pay you. Give me five more years to live. You think death will come knocking? Say, can I come and you know come into your life? No, death will come. Satan does not care whether we are rich, poor, good looking, not good looking, whether we have wisdom, we don't have, he doesn't care. Because his work is to kill, to steal, and to destroy. Right? So we cannot save ourselves from our own good works. We need a savior. And that's where John 3.16 came into came into light. Right? What is John 3.16? All of us must know this. Come on, any one of us can read it. John 3.16. You have to open your Bible. Come on. God so loved the world. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish. Right Now the, the, the key word in that entire verse is whoever or whosoever believes in him. There is no, the Lord Jesus hasn't put any limitations there. He's not saying only if you're a, you, know, you believe in me, only if you believe in the law, only if you believe in Abraham and Moses and Isaac and Jacob. Then, you know, if you believe in me, you'll have everlasting life. No. See, anyone, whoever it is, whatever background, whatever age, whatever, you know, faith they were in, it does not matter. Right? Whoever believes in him. So God sent his son to this earth to die for us. And he bore all our sins on the cross. Right? Salvation is a free gift that is given to each one of us. Right? It's a complete free gift. It sets us free from sickness, sets us free from sin. Now, each one of us here, how many of you were paid money to become a believer? How many of you were forced to become a believer? How many of you were forced to join the Bible college? Because it is a free gift. Salvation is a free gift. It's, it's free. Right? Now, if it's somebody's birthday, right, and somebody gives you a gift, will you take out your, OK, how much is this gift? Will you want to give them some money? You wouldn't want to do that. I mean, it's a gift. It's just given to you. You, you have nothing in return for that. The Lord Jesus, when he died on the cross, he, he did it as a gift for you and me. So every believer, every person in this world needs a savior. Every person. There's a saying, you know, in every person's heart, there is a God-shaped vacuum, right? which means one, one empty place in our heart, which only God can fill. Nobody else can fill it. No father, no mother, no friend no brother no sister nobody no money no 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 fame nothing can fill that empty space only god can fill it and it's there in every one of us right i'll share this example this is this is an example i i read many many years back how many of you heard of pete sampras the tennis player uh, there was a there's a tennis player, his name is Pete Sampras. He was a Wimbledon champion, right? Uh, have you heard of tennis? Most of you have heard of tennis, yeah? Yes or no, guys, uh, you've heard of tennis, right? It's a, it's a sport, right? So Pete Sampras was a wonderful tennis player. And this is in the early 90s. At a young age, when he was five or six years old, he wanted to be a tennis player. So he would go when he was five, six years old, he would go with his father. And early in the morning, they would get up. Now, is it easy to get up early in the morning as a child? So you get up, he'll go practice. He had one goal in his mind. One day, I want to win 
and be the best tennis player. That's all his goal was. So all his life he sacrificed. All his friends will go for partying. He'll say, no, I have to go for practice. All his friends are enjoying and going for vacations and holidays. He'll say, no, I, want, I have to go back to practice. So finally, when he was about in his 20s, early 20s, he got into the, you know, the best of the best. And in his early 20s, 24, 25, he won the Wimbledon, which is the highest form of, you know, winning in tennis. It's like winning the World Cup, right? So he won the Wimbledon. The dream that he had when he was six years old, he achieved it. But you know, he writes in his documentary, he writes that he came back home. He kept the trophy in his showcase. He looked at the trophy and he said, I'm still feeling empty. I still feel no joy. I still feel lonely. Why? The whole his life he was praying for that trophy only he wanted. But when he got it, he's saying, I'm still empty. So every person in this world needs a savior. We must understand it. So when we are sharing the gospel, never feel that, oh, this person, everything is all right. Uh, he has big money, he has big car, you know, he has good health. He may not need Jesus. No, he needs Jesus. Okay? So always remember that. Every person needs Jesus. What about the president, the prime minister? Yes. What about all these rich businessmen and these uh, influential people? Yes, they need Jesus. Okay, second point. There is only one Savior, and he is Jesus Christ. Let's read Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. It's in your notes, so you can just read it from your notes. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. Nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There is salvation in no other name. Let's read 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. For there, For is, there one is one God and one mediator between God and men, and the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom for all to the testified in due time. So there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. So there is no other mediator, right? There is only one savior, one person who died on the cross and his name is Jesus. Now, let me ask you this question. If you knew, right? Example, you know, the in early 2020, the coronavirus was spread all across our nation. If you knew there was a, a cure for that, would you not tell your friends? You will. I'm sure all of you said, you know, to your friends, hey, you drink ginger water, you know, drink warm water, stay indoors, always wear your mask, sanitize your hands. You would have told your friends. Why? Because you care for them. Now imagine you knew that you know you know that a person, a friend of yours, has not accepted Jesus. And you know that if he does not accept Jesus, what will happen? There's eternal hell. And imagine I don't tell them. Will it make sense? No, because for coronavirus only we were taking so much of trouble. Hey, you know, do this, do this. We had a list. Did you take the vaccine? But we know this here. We know that when when the Lord, when people accept the Lord Jesus. They're taken away from a place of hell. They're taken away from a place of sin into God's presence. Amen? Right? So there is only one Savior. People are hurting. People are searching. Many, many of them are searching for God. They're not able to find because they're searching in the wrong place. They're searching. They're searching in the wrong place. When we look around, there's all kinds of people. There are people who are rich, affluent, influential. They are looking out for meaning, for purpose in life. They are looking out for direction, fulfillment. 
many of them you know, that you know who who are influential they don't like their lifestyle they are in. they don't like it hey money can only satisfy to a certain point money cannot buy relationships i i know many people who are very wealthy but they don't have friends they live a lonely life right the spiritual searching that happens uh, for an encounter of truth you know if you look look at uh, you know some of those posters you see sadhu sundar singh there right what was he doing he was searching he was searching for a god if you read his story he was searching who is this true god if you are truly god you reveal yourself god revealed himself to sadhu sundar singh and and we know what a great work he did right so people are searching right now you may say no my friends are fine they are not searching they are happy in their uh, what they are doing that they can show outwardly right remember we can we can show something but our heart is somewhere else right people can show that everything is fine in their life but inside god knows what is happening right let's read proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12 there is a way that seems right to a man but its end is the way of death there's a way that seems right to us we feel that this is the right way right we may feel okay what i'm doing is right but if the bible says here its end is death so you and i need to lovingly bring people correct people and bring them to christ now here i want to say this as a church when i say church not apc as a body of christ some of the mistakes we have made is we have forced our you know our thoughts on people we have forced them right or we have done ministry the wrong way right uh, we have said you know if you don't believe in jesus you'll go to hell now we know that right but there's a way to tell the other person there's a way to minister to people we should you know speak to them lovingly imagine somebody says you know comes and tells me you know what if you don't believe in jesus you'll go to hell you'll burn in hell just because of their tone i'll say it's better to go there right than to listen to you so there's a way to speak there's a way to talk there's a way to minister to people we do it we correct but we do it lovingly right? and even as we go on with this course we will learn how to minister to people right what what are the attitudes that we must have john chapter 10 and verse 10 the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy but i have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly the thief what is the job of this of the enemy he's come to kill steal and destroy that's all his job is so sometimes as believers we feel oh why is this problem here why is this happening to me why is this uh, you know all these seasons this difficulty coming to me see satan is doing his job he's come to kill steal and destroy but what does jesus say what does he follow up but i have come to give you life right so there will be people around us who are living in sin who are living a very ungodly life they don't even maybe they they have a christian name but they don't have a christian life you and i must remember that the devil comes to kill to steal and to destroy but the lord jesus give us eternal life right god has commissioned us to share the gospel to of jesus christ now here's the thing you know let me share this example many years ago i was working in the corporate sector right and i wanted to i became a believer but i wanted to share the gospel with people i wanted to do ministry so i would pray i said god 
Enville, I don't like this office. Come to office and then from morning to evening, I'm here. I like my job. It's a good job, but I want to do ministry, Lord. So for many, for a long time, I was you know, grumbling, complaining. God, when will I join ministry? One day the Lord spoke to me. He said, you're worried about ministry? Start where you are. Where are you? Office. How many people around you? More than 2,000 people. Because it was a big office building. Thousands of people come and work there in those companies. He said, okay, God, how do I share? I was just like all of us. You know, I was fearful. I didn't know how to share. I didn't know what to say. All I knew is Jesus touched me. Jesus changed my life. But how do I share this to people? I began to read the scriptures. And I understood that all I need to do is speak the word of God. Right? And we'll talk about that later. How the word is so powerful to touch people's lives. So I came to this verse in, in the book of Luke where... Uh, Luke chapter 24, 36 through 49. Let's read that. Luke 20, 24, 36 to 49. And I'll explain what happened in the corporate sector as well. Now, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened, and suppose they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your heart? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hand and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, Have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate in their presence. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and prophets and the psalm concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might compare the scriptures. Uh, did you read till 49, verse 49? Yes, I am reading. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it is. it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the, th from the, dead, the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you were witness of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are in, endued with power from on high. Okay. Now, the, the first time I read this, I, I, I understood so much from this passage. See, number one, there is no other person who died and resurrected from the dead. Is there anybody else? Anybody uh, who has died and resurrected himself from the dead? Right, the Lord Jesus, when he resurrected, now he was not a ghost, he was not some spirit walking around, he was flesh and blood, meaning he was, he was, he was, he ate, right? He ate food. He they could, they, what did Jesus say to the disciples? He said, He said to Thomas, Come and touch me, touch and see, because uh, I'm not spirit, flesh and blood, I am flesh and blood. You can touch and see, right? Now. When we think of this, that the Lord Jesus, he died, he resurrected from the dead, and he defeated the devil, and he's telling, I have commissioned you to go. So for example, right? For example, you are here. Now you want to do ministry, OK? And you go, you get a letter from the Prime Minister or the President of India, you get a letter. And the letter says, so and so person can preach the gospel anywhere. Nobody should touch him. Nobody should say anything to him. You got a letter, right? Now, how confident you will be? Will you be confident? What will you do first? 
you will go to the worst areas where there is more persecution you will stand there you will preach and you want to say hey what are you doing you can't do this first thing you'll do is you'll take out the letter see the president has given me a letter saying i can preach anywhere in india or anywhere in this world and i can preach anywhere nobody can stop me so i'll say okay since you got the letter you go ahead right now jesus the son of god the messiah he said you i have commissioned you i i i'm telling you i'm writing and i'm telling you i've commissioned you go and use my name and preach the gospel and make disciples he goes on there and he says behold i am with you until the end of time i am with you now the president will give a letter but he's not with you but there's weightage in that letter jesus is giving the letter and she's also saying he's giving the authority and he's also saying i'm there with you when you preach when you teach i'm there i'm standing with you so when you look in the book of acts when you read all through the book of acts you see a powerful ministry that was established the church you see the church established in the book of acts when the great apostle paul started his ministry you see a powerful ministry right how how is it because jesus says i am with you so that really inspired me i said okay god now i'm in this workplace how do i start evangelizing so i got a simple idea before we start our work we reach office probably about half an hour before so i said okay i'll carry my guitar i spoke to one of one or two christian friends there and i said hey why don't we have 10 minutes of worship 10 minutes of the word 10 minutes we'll share one word 5 minutes prayer we'll close it off 25 minutes and we can go get into our offices start the work so one one two of them said okay in that two one person came so this is early morning if we have to log in at 8 o'clock 7:30 is the prayer right so we are there in the now this is in the corporate setting right this is not church this is outside right everyone are watching there's a lawn area right so if you have to go to the office there's a big open space lawn area you have to walk and you have to go so it was very embarrassing right people are watching what is this what is this guy come with a guitar for but then that day i remember the first day we took the guitar we started playing one song my friend was there we sang one two songs then we just opened the word spent 10 minutes in the word prayed and we closed i went back home and i said god this is one person came right i sent so many invitations to people one person came i remember god saying you do i will i will help you right so i just kept doing it every day prayer i became five people I became 10 people right then i began to share with people you know people started to share that you know they they received healing they receive uh, you know miracles in their life so they started inviting other people in 5 6 months we were 70 people 80 people in in more than after a year we were 120 130 people now this is where these are all corporate guys right office people we all come 120 people sitting in the lawn right and then slowly after the next year we were 200 people we were not allowed to sit so we said okay we'll take a room take a hall we took a hall we started having our prayers there right? so we moved it from uh, every day to saturday 2 3 hours and in during that whole time you know who were the most regular people people who were managers people who were senior managers head of operations the top guys they would come and sit and i would be surprised say boy so you have come here yeah i've come because uh, my my family is breaking my children don't listen to me they've got so many problems but when we look at them in office they are all suited and you know they're all walking around you know you feel that there's no problem but they would come and sit pray for me i feel lonely. i feel i i feel depressed I feel i want to commit suicide my wife does not love me i don't know what i'm doing in life I, and to me i thought to myself 
these people are high up in the ladder they are so you know people uh, they are so respected but they've come because i realized that every person needs a savior nobody can be on their own right? and that gave me such an encouragement it doesn't matter who you are you can come to jesus just the way we are right humbling ourselves and he'll change our life right the same commission that jesus has given us he says in uh, that we are witnesses you know the greek word for witness means martyr how many of you know what is a martyr a martyr is somebody who is willing to give his life for christ who was the first martyr of the church come on who is the first martyr no jesus no but who like for the cause of yes, stephen stephen apostle stephen apostle stephen was the first martyr okay yeah anybody else who was the first martyr who was killed for the sake of jesus first person who was killed john the baptist serene says john the baptist okay 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 so if you look through the scriptures you see that james right james who was the disciple of jesus was killed by king herod first so he was the first uh, martyr for christ right he was killed by the sword uh, James, the disciple, then came uh, Stephen, and uh, again John the Baptist as well. So, a martyr is somebody who is willing to give his life for the Lord. And it says here, right, we are called to be witnesses. That means we are called to be martyrs for Christ. Very hard, no? Is it easy? I say no. We all love our life. We don't want to. But that's the call. That's the call that God has given us. The good news is not good news until it reaches a person. And the Lord Jesus had good news. Imagine he said he didn't tell anybody about the good news. Did Jesus anyway shy, shy away from who he is? Did he say, oh, no, don't tell anybody right now? Everywhere he went, he said, I am, I am the one you're talking about. Before Abraham was, I am. Are you the Messiah? Yes, I am. They took him to stone him. They couldn't do anything. But imagine the disciples when he shared with them. He chose simple people with simple jobs and made them great leaders. The good news is not good news until it reaches people. Right? Imagine a prisoner in life sentence. Oh, this is a good one. Imagine this. Picture this. You're in a court, right? And the judge is sitting there on his on his seat. I said, okay, this fellow is a murderer. Life imprisonment. He can never come out of prison. So he's murdered somebody. Now, as the judge is going to take that thing and, and, and make his decision, he's going to say, okay, life sentence. All of a sudden, one man comes and says, okay, stop. This fellow is a murderer. But what I will do is, you set him free. I will take his place. The judge is saying, why? But you didn't do anything wrong. Why do you have to suffer in jail? It is that person. He killed somebody else. This other man says, no, I love him so much, so I want to do this. Judge says, okay, somebody has to take the judgment. Right? Somebody has to pay the price. Whether it is you or you, I don't know. But somebody has to pay the price. Now, you're saying you'll take the place of this murderer? It's up to you. So the murderer will go free. He says, okay, it's okay. And so this person comes and takes the place of the murderer. And he takes the punishment. The murderer just walks home. He's free. And that is what Jesus did for each one of us. And imagine this, we are sharing this to somebody, right? 
maybe somebody who does not believe when we're sharing this, it will touch their heart. It will minister to them. Somebody else paying the price for my sin. Where I had to be on the cross, somebody else took it for me. I had to take that judgment of God. Somebody else took it for me. Right? You know, people cannot believe in Jesus Christ unless we tell. We, we, people cannot believe. Right? And let me give you this example. Many, many years ago, I had a good friend, and he's still my friend. Okay? And uh, he was from a different faith. You know, he was a, from a Muslim faith. And what happened was we, we were very good friends. We would always talk. But one of the most important discussions we would have is about Christianity. So I, he will bring up, he was an ardent believer right, in, uh, in his faith. He's a wonderful guy, very good boy, very good friends. So we would always talk about this. He would say this. Yeah, I would say, this. no, this is what it is. He would say, he had good arguments. He would say, you know, how can it be? But throughout all of this, right, he always said Jesus is very good. He's a prophet. He's a man of God. But he's not God. He's a good man. He's a prophet. He's not God. And later on this in this uh, course, we'll also learn how to share the gospel with a Hindu, how to share the gospel with a uh, Muslim. Uh, but just sharing this, after many, many months, six, seven months, you know, one day I was saying, God, how do I? How you minister to him. I know you can use this boy. And I remember this. You know, in, in, in their scriptures, it says that you know, God came, Moses was there, God came in the bush and ministered to Moses. Right? They they believe in the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, of the of the scriptures, right? So God came into the bush and spoke to Moses. I thought to myself, hey, so he asked me this question. How can God become man? Impossible. I remember telling him, in the scriptures, it says, God came and spoke to Moses in the bush. Your scriptures say that. I said, if God can come and speak, as a, come in the bush and speak as a fire, can't God come into this world as a human being? Is it so difficult? He thought about it. He thought about it. He had no answer. He took weeks. And thankfully, a couple of months later, after ministering, ministering he became a believer. He became a full-time minister, preaching the gospel. What if I was just friends with him and not willing to share with him? He would have been doing what he is doing. Right? So all of us, we will get opportunities. But it is our responsibility to take that opportunity. Right? What is the urgency? You know, some people say that Jesus is a good man. Some people say that Jesus did not die on the cross. Some people say that Jesus did not die physically. Uh, he was on the cross. He didn't die. So when they brought him down from the cross, he came, got back his life. And he went back home. Then some people say Jesus was not even a human being. He was something else. So there are different understandings. What does the Bible say? He died and he resurrected. And he's alive and he's coming again. Right? What is the urgency of all of this? Why do we need to share the gospel? First of all, do we want to share the gospel? Are we interested in sharing the gospel? Right? We must be, right? So what is the urgency? One, there is no second chance. Right, let's read this. First, Second Corinthians 4, 3 to 4. Second Corinthians 4, 3. It's in your notes. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is valid to those who are perishing. Those minds the God of this age has blinded would do who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For even if the gospel it is, is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. 
Remember, there's no second chance. In the Bible, we read about uh, the rich man and Lazarus. What does the rich man say? Oh, only if I can get a drop of water. Right? And or, 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 or just send your, send your prophets to talk to my brothers so that they don't have to suffer like this. No second chance. The Bible says when we are absent in the body, we are present with the Lord. Very simple. There is no middle place. If we as believers, if we are absent in the body, we are present with the Lord. We are in heaven. Now, what about unbelievers? If they are absent in the body, they are present in a place of torment. And that is the truth. There's no second chance. We can't say, give me one more chance. I want to go and I'll believe in Jesus. We can't do that. So now is the time. right? There's no second chance. Secondly, time is running out. 2020 odd years ago, Jesus said, what did he say? I am coming. What does he say? I'm coming soon. Behold, I am coming soon. 2020, more than 2020 years ago. I'm coming soon. Now, imagine how close we are. When we look at what is around us, when we look at the things that are happening around us, Right? Time is going. Time is passing. God's clock is ticking. We're growing closer to the end of time. Now, it's not to make us scared, but we should be encouraged that, hey, God is, God is going to use us. Even as each one of us are here, we've come here to study, to do ministry. Right? We must understand that God is going to use each one of us to minister to people. You all will go to places, those online as well, you will go to places where we may not be able to go. Many of you from uh, Rajasthan and different country, different states, we may not even be able to go there. But you have the opportunity to reach out. Right? Heaven is real. Hell is real. Life is short. And there will come a time uh, you know, that each one of us will stand so very important, don't be ashamed of the gospel. Right? Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, first for the Jews first and also for the Greeks. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. You know, when you look at the cross, the Lord Jesus, when he died on the cross, it was not... Have you seen, you've seen... You've seen Passion of the Christ, no? All of you have seen Passion of the Christ. Passion of the Christ is nothing. Because if you look at a Roman persecution, if you had seen Jesus, literally you would have been able to see his organs. It is a gruesome death. You would have seen his heart, you would have seen his bones, his spinal cords, everything. Not a drop of blood was left in him. The price was fully paid. He died naked on the cross for you and me. Imagine how much we must do for him. We must never be ashamed of the gospel. Now, don't be ashamed means don't wear one chain with a cross and say, I'm not ashamed. That anybody can do. Don't put one tattoo and say, I'm a Christian. That doesn't matter. The enemy is not afraid of that chain with the cross. Not at all. You show the enemy a cross, good. But he's afraid when you know the power of the cross. Amen? Right? So wearing a cross is no big deal. Anybody can do that. It's become a show now. But the point is believing in that cross. Right? Don't be ashamed. Lastly, take it on yourself to witness about this glorious, wonderful Savior. Take it. And, you know, all you need to, God is not waiting for you to get a BTH certificate, get a CTH, DTH. He doesn't want certificates. He wants you to be willing to go and minister. That's all he wants. Right? 
1 Corinthians 9.16 says, For I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Right? So, today we have covered this chapter, uh, the urgency and necessity of the gospel. Um, and we'll pick up from next week. Uh, let's just close in prayer. Right? If you have questions, maybe next week we can uh, answer those questions. Let's close in prayer. Father, we want to thank you for this time. Thank you for enabling us to study your God. And I pray that each one of us will grow and you will empower us to be witnesses for your kingdom, Lord. We thank you for this time. We bless all our students here and online, those who are going to be listening through the e-learning portal. I pray your blessing over each one of us. Use us, Lord, to be witnesses of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you all uh, online students. I'll see you next week. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you.